Uh, my name is Michael Burroughs, and I am Acting Associate Director of the Rock Ethics Institute. And I'm here today with Dr. Larry Nucci, uh, who's Professor of Education at the University of California uh, at Berkeley. Um, so, Dr. Nucci, thanks very much for joining us and being with us today. Well, thank you uh, for the invitation. Sure. Um, so, basically, I just wanted to ask a, a few questions about um, your research on moral education and moral development um, and uh, give our audience just a better sense of the work you, you've been doing for many years now. Mm -hmm. um, so to start, a, a general question about um, social domain theory. Um, for those who don't know a lot about social domain theory, um, what is meant by um, domains and how do you focus on those in your research? Well, the idea of domains, uh, I guess another way to talk about them would be conceptual frameworks. Uh, they are ways of accounting for um, how we understand issues of uh, morality would be one of these domains, and, and how it, it takes into account issues of fairness and justice, and uh, it, it, how it's different from the domain of societal convention, which is another domain and finally, this domain of personal choice or prerogative, the personal domain. Uh, the domains, I guess an analogy would be to think of them as like primary colors. Uh, our visual system has only three primary colors that it's sensitive to, but we're able to apply those three colors to see a multicolored world. Uh, these domains are basic frameworks for understanding the social world uh, in terms of issues of right and wrong that we then can apply to complex situations, bringing in our moral understandings, our understandings of convention, and our understandings of what we have a right to do as personal choice. So you talk in your research, too, about the you know, experiences that help form these domains in mm -hmm. early childhood. Can you give an example of some of the experiences that might form, say, the moral versus the social domain? Sure. Um, Issues of morality uh, have to do with uh, actions that affect other people, so a prototypical social experience that would start in early childhood would be the experience of unprovoked harm. So one kid hitting another uh, without provocation would be a prototypical moral experience. Another would be um, most children who've had either a sibling or a, a peer interaction have had something taken away from them. This would be a primary moral experience, sharing things with people. Uh, in the area of social convention, it would be things like uh, table manners or uh, dressing differently to go out to dinner as opposed to going to play, uh, uh, being told uh, what the rules or expectations are. So conventions have to do with things that vary from context to context, whereas moral issues have to do with fundamental aspects of interacting with people. A prototypical experience around something that would be personal would be uh, keeping a diary private or uh, your choice of who your best friend is, um, not wanting somebody to listen in on a phone call. These would be the sort of social encounters. In, in early childhood with children, uh, it begins with things like choice of foods and choice of playmates. Uh, those kinds of choices are personal. So would it be fair to say that the experiences come first and the domains come later? Exactly. These uh, domains are constructed out of these social experiences. Uh, many of them are these basic prototypical experiences of harm or fairness. And these uh, conventional experiences come around hearing about social rules in different contexts. Uh, we've actually done studies observing children in the home and looking at uh, children in uh, preschools. And we uh, see that the social messages that are associated with these domains are different. So in the area of morality, the discourse is around the effects of the actions. Ow, oh, that hurt me. Uh, how would you like that if somebody did that to you? Whereas around social convention, it'll be something like, uh, that's not how we do things, or that's against the rules, or remember what we said you're supposed to do here. And around the personal would be a lot of times the social experiences come from the child resisting the parent and then the parent then negotiating with them 
or saying, uh, what would you like to wear today, implying that there's a choice, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that in a lot of instances, um, maybe even the majority of instances, I don't know, um, there would be a lot of intersection between social and moral issues. That, would, that, that children would have to uh, parse out, maybe implicitly or, or explicitly if they're in an yeah. educational setting, I don't know. But how do you see those intersections happening in, say, early childhood context, perhaps? Um, well, let, let me give you a, a way, uh, an example of how things can intersect yeah. so that this can be understood, because it's probably the part of the theory that people misunderstand. Mm -hmm. um, if I were to ask you how much is 10 divided by 4, okay, and we know you're a professor, so you, you come up with 2 and a half, and if we were to talk about what area of knowledge you would use, we would say it's math or particularly arithmetic. Now consider the problem that four kids would have uh, if they've worked together over the week delivering newspapers and they've earned 10 bucks. Now they have these $10 but they didn't talk ahead of time about how to divide it up. Okay, is this a math problem or a moral problem? Uh, it's certainly a quantity problem. You have to, you have to use your math because somehow you get to divide 10 by 4. But nobody would argue that this is just strictly a math problem. We would say this is a problem of fairness, of distribution. How are we going to divide it up? Even Stephen or give more to the people who delivered more papers or something like that. In this one example of how these kids are supposed to divide up these $10, they're bringing in two different conceptual frameworks, mathematics and morality. Nobody I know would try to teach math by having kids talk about fairness. Nobody I know who would try to raise moral education or engage in moral education would teach kids arithmetic and give them a lot of arithmetic homework. Uh, because we understand that these conceptual frameworks are different, they're structured differently, and they come out of different experiences. Mm. So in constructing these domains, the kids are picking up on these prototypical experiences, these basic experiences of fairness, of harm, uh, of the language around things like uh, don't eat with your hands, uh, uh, that's not the ladylike way to sit, all these different messages we get. So we're putting together these different understandings of morality and convention, but in context, we may have to bring them together. Okay, so I hope that, I hope no, that addresses helpful. it. Yeah, that's no, a helpful example. Um, so can you talk a bit about um, your social domain theory and the research you do in relation to um, some other historically prominent uh, models of moral development, like for instance, we've been talking about Kohlberg today. Sure. I'm wondering where you see your theory as being uh, maybe areas where it comes together with Kohlberg sure. and areas where it comes apart from, from that, that form of moral sure. development research. Well, uh, Kohlberg um, uh, you know, emerged from the work of, of Piaget, and what Kohlberg uh, found by having people uh, talk about or resolve moral dilemmas was what he thought was a progression of six stages through three levels that moved from a pre-conventional to a conventional level where morality and uh, convention and morality and the laws of society are, are uh, d connected together conceptually to a point where developmentally people separate out morality from convention and reflect back on convention. The relationship we have to that theory is that in both theoretical frameworks, we both assume that development is a function of people making sense out of their social experiences and constructing their understandings. So uh, we, we are completely uh, consistent with Kohlberg's theoretical framework in terms of understanding that development is a construction, it's, a, it's built. Um, where it differs is that our, our research indicates that kids differentially uh, understand convention and morality at very early ages, that uh, kids will treat moral issues as right or wrong independent of the existence of a rule beginning as soon as we can interview them uh, at age two and a half or three. So convention and morality are differentiated from the beginning at least in terms of the research that we've done. 
So in that sense, uh, Kohlberg's framework, uh, from our point of view, was, uh, was uh, inaccurate or incomplete. Where they would also come together is our understanding of what Kohlberg's stages were. Uh, he purposely set up his interviews to pit law against uh, and convention against morality. And his interview is, is particularly set up to get at how people weigh morality against convention. And that's because he came directly from a Kantian point of view where autonomous morality is where you can stand outside of your social norms and take a moral point of view. So his interview was already set up in such a way that he was trying to look at convention and morality at the same time. So from our perspective, what Kohlberg was doing was looking at how people coordinate morality and convention without realizing he was dealing with two systems. He thought he was dealing with a single system, when in fact, the way his interview was set up, his methodology uh, was looking at how these two systems interact rather than how each of these systems developed independently. Right. Because in the base of a Coburg in the one system framework, he's thinking of the kind of conventional reasoning as, you know, both uh, descriptively and normatively lower on the scale of right. moral development, right? So if you're thinking yeah. about moral issues in terms of convention, you are less right. uh, less moral, less of a moral agent than someone who is thinking of it in terms right. of a autonomous law that they give themselves. Yeah, and in fact, his whole educational goal was to get people to this third level where uh, this higher level where people differentiated morality away from convention mm -hmm. and so yeah it was a higher stage a higher level and a more adequate way of thinking morally what he did never do though is he never said that these people were morally superior what he was saying was that their moral reasoning was better right yeah right yes and so you also have with Kohlberg a very linear progression right I mean, right you, you you have to go through the stages sequentially. Right. You can't go back. Right. right. He didn't really talk about regression as far as I understand it. Uh, he talked about it. And yeah. from a structuralist perspective, regression is actually impossible. Okay. Because uh, your prior stage doesn't exist to go back to. Uh, it exists as uh, content incorporated in the higher stage. So uh, when, uh, you may know the history that I'm sure you do, <laughs> that uh, in their research, in their longitudinal research, <clears throat> they had this apparent evidence of a regression in adulthood, and that was seen as a complete contradiction to the theory, mm -hmm. and caused, I think, the, the whole, well, it led Turiel and uh, other people to start looking at how to account for it, and that's really where domain theory emerged from. Hmm. See, that's interesting. I mean, the adulthood piece is, um, is interesting, because I think when we're, when we're talking about moral development, um, we're often thinking of moral development as the task of the child. Right. Um, and sometimes implicitly, I think what gets framed in uh, developmental theories, given that they focus on childhood, is that adults aren't really the proper subjects of moral development. Right. They just are people who are <coughs> developed. Right. right? Um, and that's, you know, that's made me think, you know, John Dewey has a, a really interesting passage in Democracy uh, and Education, where he talks about this notion of, this false notion of, of uh, growth leading to a static end, such uh -huh. that adults would just right. be considered, you know, the adult is basically a state of ungrowth uh -huh. because they have completed development and the task right. of development is just uh -huh. for the child. And he's basically arguing against that notion. Um, I'm wondering, when you, in your theory uh, and the work that you do, do you think, uh, uh, do you think about adulthood in, in, in certain lights? Do you think of it, are, are there particular developmental tasks that are important in adulthood as opposed to childhood? How do you think about that? Well, if you take um, a structural uh, developmental perspective the way that Piaget did, um, there probably is a, a, a topping out of those kinds of, of, of changes somewhere in adolescence. Mm -hmm. But that isn't the end of development as growth in the ways in which you weigh and uh, relate these issues of morality to one another or how you weigh and relate issues of morality to the conventions of the society you lived in or changes that you need to make and updating your moral thinking as changes in information come about. Uh, there's some really nice work showing that uh, 
uh, young uh, college students uh, view lying inside of a marriage much more moralistically than adults who are married, which means that unless you've been married, you don't really know what you're talking about. And so uh, I think, you know, if we view ourselves as finished products, we're not going to question these ideas we have about right and wrong that were set at some point. If, and, and some people, unfortunately, may do that. Uh, but uh, my, my understanding of uh, what it would be to be an adult is you remain open to uh, continual challenges to how you think about things and the continual reworking of things. And from this domain framework, in fact, continually updating what you think is right based on how you've laid things out at some point in your life. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, and, and for, from this theoretical framework, development is lifelong, it, and it doesn't end. Mm -hmm. so do you have, I mean, uh, within your, your framework, is there, is there a part of it that you would say could be understood on like a stage theory model? Like there are certain levels of, of stages, say maybe, uh -huh. You know, on, the, on, the, on the cognitive side of things, that you say, okay, well, at least at, at broadly at these ages, someone's going to be here or here. But at the same time, even if they're at a certain stage, it doesn't mean they're more or less, you know, moral. It means that there's there's still going to be constant development going on that's very gonna be very contextual, for instance, in relation to what's happening socially and morally in a given situation. Like, is are you combining both of those? Sometimes? Yeah, we are. And in fact. Um, uh, Somebody who does this in the area of mathematics is Jeffrey Sachs. And what we're combining really is what we'll call the uh, ontogenetic line of development and the sociogenetic line of development. And in fact, uh, there are, in the moral area, there is a pretty uh, substantial change from uh, children who are unable to coordinate uh, more than one perspective at a time. Uh, their understandings of fairness uh, uh, work well when they're trying to think about what's fair for someone or what's fair for someone else. What they have a hard time with is figuring out what's fair when there are competing interests. Mm -hmm. That changes with uh, development of reciprocity. And that's somewhere around ages six to eight. You have later developments in the moral area in adolescence where kids go through what looks like a J curve in development, where their understandings of morality uh, broaden as they're able to take into account more and more things. Mm -hmm. And they see more gray areas. And at the same time, they're expanding what they think is their own business and what they have a right to do. And they appear to have a hard time pulling all this together in context where they feel that uh, maybe I, so if you ask them, uh, would it be wrong or all right to keep money somebody drops? Uh, and they would say, well, you know, you should give it back. Would you have a right to do it if you chose to? About half of them will say, yeah, you have a right to, because they're having a hard time coordinating this. Uh, as they get older, then, they have a better, better sense of how to put together all the complexity and morality and pull together all this stuff where uh, it does make more sense. So there, there are these large sort of gross changes we see. In the area of convention, we see something similar. Um, Fifth graders, for the first time in their lives, understand conventions to be um, there are people in charge that make up the rules. There are people below that. If they follow the rules, then we have less chaos in the world. There's less running around in the hallways. They hit adolescence, and the kids think to themselves again, oh, these conventions are just arbitrary. They change from situation to situation. They're simply the dictates of authority. They don't matter. Mm -hmm. and so. So from the point of view of a kid in middle school, these conventions are trivial, mm -hmm. don't matter. Uh, and later, they reflect on this again, and they put together the idea, these conventions literally don't matter one at a time, but collectively, they organize the way a system works. Mm -hmm. So they, for the first time in their lives, understand the relationship between conventions as constituent elements of social systems. Mm -hmm. So we do see these sort of gross uh, changes, both in the moral area and in the area of convention. Uh, but in many ways, what's more interesting are the ways in which people are weighing these things in context. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when kids are, are as they're developing, you're ha you have an intersection between 
the, what we might call the level of reasoning and their ability to coordinate across domains. Um, and what we think is going on, particularly in adulthood, is the continual work on how these things interrelate to each other in context. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So um, I'm wondering if, you know, I, I think about a couple things uh, in relation to some of the, the things we talked about today, and one being on the level of moral responsibility. Uh -huh. um, and I'm wondering if, you know, I mean, normally when we think about moral responsibility, we think, okay, for someone to be morally responsible, they need to be rational, they need to be mm -hmm. aware of the decisions <coughs> they're making, they need to be mm -hmm. autonomous, um, at least relatively autonomous. Um, in your framework, do you think that um, there are grounds for, uh, say, between early childhood populations and adolescent populations, you would say, okay, based on the research and the work that we do, yeah. you can attribute more responsibility to a higher degree to this population and not this population. And part of the reason I ask yes. is that yeah. historically, right. there's been a lot of framing of young children as not capable of being able to make moral judgments, right? Not understanding morality. Morality is not the task of the child, right? The, the, the child's pre-moral and therefore not morally responsible for his or her actions. Therefore, not subject to moral blame, right. but also not subject <clears throat> to moral praise either, right? right. Um, and I'm wondering, does your, what would your theory have to say or offer in terms of thinking about attributions of responsibility or both on the praise right. and the blame sides you know, of, of actions? Well, young children um, already have understandings of morality in terms of uh, unprovoked harm of others and, and this sort of, they have this basic moral understanding. But they do not have this more comprehensive understandings of context, of long-term uh, effects of their actions. They're not very good at predicting future consequences of what they've done. Uh, so basically, uh, the idea of attributing responsibility to young children for moral actions has a different meaning. Mm -hmm. So it's perfectly reasonable for a mother to expect that her preschool age child can be held responsible for arbitrarily going up and whacking their sibling in the head with a toy. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that this child can be held morally responsible for accidentally picking up a parent's handgun and shooting their mm -hmm. brother. Mm -hmm. um, so we have this problem in the law right now that uh, Lawrence Steinberg of Temple University has taken on, which is at what point legally can we hold people morally responsible for criminal actions? And he's provided what I think is pretty compelling evidence that kids who are adolescents before the age, under the age of 16, clearly, one, don't have the same kind of future perspective, don't have the same capacity to coordinate things with their understandings of morality that an older person does, and they really don't understand the law or the courts or any of that. And trying uh, people as adults uh, doesn't make sense. Um, also, I mean, if we look at the work of somebody like Judy Smetana, uh, a lot of what's going on in adolescence is sorting out what are the issues of personal choice, things I should be able to decide for myself, and what are the, uh, the things that people in authority should control. Because kids are very bad at prudential decision-making. Uh, there's a whole period in adolescence of high risk-taking, uh, uh, experimentation, and so on, well-documented, which some people have argued has evolutionary value in that if young people didn't take risk, we wouldn't get anywhere. But to hold them uh, responsible in the same way that we would hold an adult for the same kinds of risk uh, ignores all this development that has yet to take place. Mm -hmm. So, um, what role do you think do you see education playing in helping children mm. to <clears throat> develop morally? I mean, what can education do, and what can education not do? Uh, okay, education cannot guarantee, uh, and education is never going to be able to guarantee uh, producing saints. Uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, what education can do uh, is with young children to work with young children on helping them figure out 
how to treat others fairly, how to balance and weigh uh, personal desires with the needs of others, how to take into account uh, how your words and actions might hurt someone, um, developing their abilities to regulate their actions and not act impulsively, and so on. As kids get older, well, I would say you could begin in early childhood beginning the process of helping kids be reflective about what they're doing and learn how to talk with other people to figure out what's the right thing to do and to continue to have these discussions with others. And as the kids get older, to begin to fold that ability to engage in discourse with the content of society, understanding how societies work, understanding history, understanding all of the culture that's taken place, and being able to continue to develop and deepen moral decision making. So uh, I think there's a lot that schools can do. Uh, and Durkheim, uh, if I go on here forever, but Durkheim recognized that one of the things that schools do is to take you out of your familiar social context and put you in a setting where you're going to be introduced to people different from who live in your family, be introduced to events in history that led to where you're living, learning about other cultures, learning about how to think ahead uh, in terms of what the world is like now, what it ought to be like. How am I now? How ought to I be? Uh, so education has uh, a rich role to play. And so are there any particularly promising um, ethics education programs that you feel are, are doing this, the work of your gesture towards here that you think would be particularly promising to have a wider um, inclusion in uh, American public education? Formal programs? Formal or informal? No. Uh, I would say <laughs> there aren't. Um, I would say there are approaches to uh, uh, discipline and classroom management that I think are very, very uh, promising. Uh, the work of Marilyn Watson and what she calls developmental discipline. I think that uh, uh, what, I, what I would argue instead of formal programs, which I actually don't think we ever actually want, mm -hmm. would be uh, I think there are promising sources of information that, that I would hope that teachers and uh, educational leaders would make themselves more aware of mm -hmm. to integrate inside of the regular curriculum and the way that schools work. Mm -hmm. So a formal program, no, we don't, schools don't need yet another, another program. They, they have enough programs. They don't need to go out and go buy a program. Mm -hmm. What they need to do, and I think this is promising, is to update their understanding of the processes of moral development and moral education mm -hmm. and integrate them into what they're doing in, uh, in terms of teaching the academic uh, content. Yeah. And this is what we're trying to do, and only I don't call it a program. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, there's parallels with the work that <clears throat> um, I and, and many others in the US have done in the philosophical realm of yeah. things. Um, where, I mean, we've talked about before, it's been a, a lot of it's been outreach work, so it's not another program that right. is being added on. It's actually coming in, trying to integrate philosophical thinking, reasoning, discussion into the curriculum, so right. in, in a history class, in an English class, yes. in a science class. Um, so I can relate to that approach, but a problem um, that I see with that approach at the same time is there's not always a lot of room in the curriculum particularly with the extreme focus on standardized testing right. in public education. Right. That's one problem. The other right. problem is that, and it connects to the first, is that you might not have teachers who are being taught right. in those ways right. to be able to kind of lead the discussions right. we're talking about. Right. So I guess part of the, the, the question, the problem that I've been thinking about recently, and it might relate to your work some as well, is how do you really have a systemic impact? Because um, it seems like that, Part, part of that happens at the level of policy, perhaps. Right. Um, and given policy is directed so much towards testing and these quantifiable aspects in right. that regard. So can you have more than a grassroots impact? Um, or is that really the focus you should have and try and build up from there? Uh, I, I, it, I don't have an answer. It's just kind right. of an open question I'm thinking about. 
Well, um, you know, I don't want to make it sound like an advertisement, but I, I actually think w the way that we're trying to do it is the best way, uh, given what we know currently. <clears throat> that is, we're, we're working with teachers in school districts to provide them with the in-services for how to lead genuine moral discourse around the academic content they're trying to teach. Mm -hmm. The regular curriculum is filled with moral issues. Mm -hmm. School experiences have many, many moral issues. You don't need to add yet another period in a day called moral education. Right. So it, it, for me, it would be integrated inside of the teaching of history, inside of the teaching of literature, inside of even science education, as we were talking earlier this morning, that what, what you would want would be, uh, w what I would eventually hope I could help to contribute to, are ways in which to prepare teachers mm -hmm. for how to do this integration of moral discourse, of identifying these moral issues and co issues of convention, issues of the personal, and how kids deal with it within the curriculum itself. And I haven't said much about this issue of the personal and private, but literature is filled with this, with debates between being an individual as opposed to fitting in. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, these, are, these are highly engaging issues for students. Mm -hmm. And instead of it running counter to the goals of academics, our work shows that in fact it increases student engagement, it increases academic performance. It's a win-win. Mm -hmm. And what I refer to as a two-for-one that what we should be working towards are ways of integrating moral education more generally so that we can get both this academic and uh, social, emotional, and moral development throughout uh, the, the curriculum. Um, the idea of, uh, of a program would be that you have to somehow set aside some special time for it. That's, that's been shown not to work, particularly in the US. Mm -hmm. Uh, perhaps in countries where they actually have mandated um, moral education time, maybe they'll want to do that. But uh, I, I, at this point, both because of our knowledge base and where we are, and just from a basic understanding of how American education works, I would not argue in favor of a separate program. Right. So it seems like then, that if we you know, wanted to extend it, say, the work you're doing um, to other areas in the states, not necessarily the form of a program. What that would really look like is having people who have been trained appropriately, yes. right? whether that's teachers or researchers or whoever yes. that, that might be, and really being able to do this kind of contextually in relation that's to the right. curriculum that's being taught in a particular district or that's right. a particular school. Yes. And so it might not be, I mean, the, the, the term that I know um, a lot of people use in the, uh, the having a scalable project, right? People right. are always thinking in those terms. And I've had issues with that before too, because scalable is one metric of success, but what's, right. the, what's the quality <clears throat> of, as you're as you're getting right. larger and larger? So really, maybe this kind of contextual approach um, in relation to a district and a school, and that's the way you mark success. And that's the way you can do the work well. I I would agree. I I think one thing that could be done, however, um, is that as teachers generate lessons, uh, they could put them on the internet. That is, teachers could look at lessons that have been constructed already. Uh, so instead of ha starting from scratch for how do I talk about John Brown's raid in moral terms, well, there are these examples of ways in which teachers have done that. Or uh, you know, how, do I, how do I discuss uh, various things in literature? Uh, so one wouldn't ha call it a program, but you could certainly put resources out there. You could put models of what people have done. And you could even have a video of uh, classrooms and discourse in which this is working. Mm -hmm. uh, you would also then need, at, at some point, if you felt confident about confident enough that you actually knew what you were doing, begin to prepare teacher educator, mm -hmm. educators uh, to be able to prepare teachers in teacher education mm -hmm. to engage in this kind of discourse and this approach to education. Okay. Well, thanks very much, um, Dr. Nucci, for your, for your time. Uh, it's been a great conversation. Well, We're looking forward to your public lecture today as well. Well, thank you very much.